The Randall cycle is a process in our bodies where glucose and fatty acids compete for substrates, which are molecules in our bodies required for energy metabolism. More simply, fats compete with carbs for use. Before we jump in, the simple answer is that overeating is the real culprit, not a combination of fats and carbs, but combining those two does make it easier to overeat. Whenever you consume an energy source, fat, carbohydrates, both, your body prioritizes using one of them. Here on the left, we have the glucose pathway in red. On the right is the fatty acid pathway in blue. In purple, in the middle, are the cell energy components that are produced towards the end of either pathway. In the middle here, this is what occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell. The bottom is what occurs in the mitochondria of the cell. When you do consume both, here in orange, we have what happens when fatty acids are blocking glucose, and in pink, we have what happens when glucose is blocking fatty acids. Again, in orange, the impairment of glucose by fatty acid oxidation, it increases along the pathway. It happens mostly at the formation of pyruvate dehydrogenase, which is an enzyme that lets us use glucose for energy, and slightly at the uptake of glucose and fructose. This starts because of increased mitochondrial ratios of acetyl coenzyme A and NADH, which is triggered by fatty acid oxidation, both inhibiting pyruvate dehydrogenase activity. Acetyl coenzyme A is a molecule that can be oxidized for energy, and NADH is needed for the cell to produce ATP. So basically, the cell already has energy from fatty acids, and the body's telling it we don't need the glucose, the glucose gets stored as glycogen in our cells or as fat. In pink, the impairment of the fatty acid oxidation happens when malonal coenzyme A signals glucose utilization, controlling the entry and oxidation of fatty acids into the mitochondria. This is stimulated by glucose in the liver. So, you know, you eat a bunch of sugar, there's glucose in the liver. The oxidation of that glucose produces citrate, which can be converted into malonal coenzyme A, which inhibits the carnitine palmitol transferase, which controls the entry and oxidation of fatty acids, promoting fatty acids to be stored as triglycerides instead of oxidized. The point is, you eat more fat, your body stores sugar as glycogen. You eat more sugar, your body stores fat as triglycerides. That's all this cycle really tells us. So. Why are people so concerned with combining fat and carbs like it's the devil? First, we have to understand digestion, the basic mechanisms in our body of what happens when we consume food, those energy sources. Both fats and carbs require enzymes and insulin to be used. Fat, obviously less insulin than carbohydrates, but when you do eat fat, your body needs a lot of bile and lipase, which is the fat digesting enzyme produced in the pancreas, bile correspondingly produced in the liver. So both your pancreas and liver are stressed when you eat fat, and not necessarily stressed, but both of those organs have to work. And for carbohydrates, you know, your pancreas is producing insulin and starch digesting enzymes, amylase, and the liver is processing the glucose and the fructose. So whether you're eating carbs or fats, your liver and pancreas are working to digest them. Now, it's difficult to overload your pancreas and liver with either carbs or fats on their own due to the natural palatability of the food. You know, you could eat all the potatoes with steak you want or all the butter with steak you want and you won't overeat enough to stress digestion. Once you combine the butter with the potato, however, the caloric density of the meal is artificially magnified past what our bodies are capable of handling. Your body cannot physically process 2,500, 3,000 calories worth of potatoes and butter in one meal. It's not going to happen. The elements working here are the liver and the pancreas to produce those digestive enzymes, more enzymes produced in the stomach and small intestine, as well as gut bacteria and yeast digesting and breaking down the food. This is really variable from person to person. The main downside is gaining weight and extreme cases could be where people get microbiome imbalances, leading to metabolic diseases such as diabetes and fatty liver. In our food palatability video a month or so ago, we spoke about hyperpalatable foods and those types of foods that combine fat, sugar, texture, seasoning, becoming very easy to overeat, bypassing your body's natural hunger signals. 
once you eat past what your body can handle from a digestive perspective, you run into problems. You don't need the Randall cycle to explain that, and it's certainly not the biggest part of the picture. The main question to ask is, if in an ideal body state, is a human meant to handle large amounts of fat and carbohydrates combined? We haven't seen that across most indigenous groups in the context of one combined meal. Generally speaking, the animal fats were separated from the carbohydrates. You can combine relatively lean protein with carbohydrates, but they never really mixed fat with carbs. And on the rare occasion they did, it was like one big meal once a day. So you can eat a ton of fat and sugar, but you have to give your body, you know, 24 to 48 hours to recover from it. Maybe a little shorter than that if you're one of the genetically lucky. So we know the body is producing way more insulin, enzymes, and very stressed from a digestive standpoint when consuming the fats and carbs. Can we counteract this? Yes, mainly by taking more digestive enzymes, possibly antimicrobials, as well as exercising. I've gone over some of those things on my Patreon, and it is helpful to exercise at some point following that very large meal. I know a lot of you guys follow Ray Pete, so let's play something from him. The um, principle in physiology that I think really explains it uh, was proposed a few decades ago. Um, it's called the Randall effect or the Randall cycle, although there's no cycle involved. Uh, it, that refers to the fact that free fatty acids uh, block the use of, of glucose by cells. And uh, that was demonstrated frequently in hospitals when they were giving um, nutrition uh, support to uh, people who couldn't eat or cancer patients who were losing weight very fast in the form of, of a soy oil emulsion. Oh, um, they saw that about 15 minutes after injecting uh, this nutritional uh, dose of, of uh, emulsified soy oil intravenously that people would uh, get hyperglycemic. And uh, the Randall effect uh, is sort of an instantaneous thing, but when the uh, fatty acids that are involved in blocking the use of sugar, uh, when those are polyunsaturated, uh, they produce long-range damage that keeps the Randall effect going, keeps blocking the use of sugar. Um, uh, a group, I think it was in South Carolina, uh, the, the lead author of one of the papers was uh, M.X. Fu, uh, who showed that uh, the uh, glycated proteins that are seen in, in diabetic people um, uh, that uh, glycated hemoglobin, for example, and they they blame that on on glucose or fructose fragments sticking to, to hemoglobin and other proteins. But uh, Fu and his group uh, demonstrated that polyunsaturated fatty acids are much more powerful uh, glycators, mm. uh, sticking fragments, uh, uh, three carbon, five carbon. Uh, and longer fragments uh, from the uh, spontaneously oxidized polyunsaturated fats stick to the proteins. And uh, so the, the free fatty acids not only block the sugar use instantaneously, but they produce these uh, uh, advanced uh, glycation end products, the AGEs. Mm -hmm. uh, that are associated with diabetes and aging. Um, so the the chronic effect of of um, a high fat diet, if the fat, if the fat diet is predominantly unsaturated, uh, produces not only diabetes but all of the uh, things that result from glycated proteins. The summary of that is: if you drink a soybean oil and sugar shake. The sugar absorption is blocked by the fat, but the main issue here is the high omega-6 polyunsaturated fat content and massive inflammation the soybean is causing, so much oxidative stress, and we know omega-6 contributes greatly to fatty liver disease. 
Now from this, we can say that if you fix the omega-3 to omega-6 fatty acid ratio in your diet, you will be much less vulnerable to the effects of over-consuming food. You know, things to be mindful of are a feedlot beef carnivore diet being high in omega-6. You know, so when people try to eat carbs again, it's no wonder that they're blaming the Randall cycle as opposed to understanding why things are actually happening. It's the same across all dietary groups. Vegans will find any reason to blame meat or saturated fat. Carnivores, ooh-wee! And keto dieters will find any reason to blame carbohydrates. You know, raw tards will find any reason to blame cooked foods. I'd like to think I've always been objective and open-minded to, you know, all food sources, all ideas about macronutrients. Granted, they are of high and natural quality. So thank you guys for joining me today. Hopefully this answers any questions you might have had about the Randall cycle. If you want to look further into these pathways, there truly is no point of understanding them. That is, if you can grasp the logical and ancestral thoughts. Although, you know, it certainly did help me a little bit uh, understanding what each of these components are. Don't worry too much about it, though. If you guys do want to support me, please leave a comment down below. Drop a like on the video. Of course, if you can share the video on social media. If you do want to support me further, you know how to do so down in the description below. Thanks again for joining me, guys. I'll see you for tomorrow's video.